that's our recording going. All right, so what we wanted to look at was uh, the book of Malachi, last book of the Bible, or last book of the Old Testament, rather. Um, and as I was just saying a moment ago, it is short. It's only four chapters and not really that many verses, but within each verse, there's a lot of back and forth and the dialogue of who's speaking. Uh, ultimately, it's kind of like a one-man play. Malachi is the prophet. He's been sent you know, a message from the Lord, and he has to deliver all the parts, whether it's the Lord speaking or the Lord telling what Israel has responded to the Lord or uh, even uh, another nation of Edom. So there's a lot of back and forth, and, and when you first approach it, it may be a little difficult to understand who's talking or what they're talking about. And so I thought if I take that text and just reformat it, and put it in the format of, um, of a play, that it might be... Uh, easier. So the way this um, document is structured, is you've got in bold um, the person who they're speaking and who they're speaking on behalf. And I've got Malachi all the way the far left because he's really speaking for all these parts. Um, and then after the colon is the actual text of what um, they're saying. And if I who they're talking to, I felt like that was necessary to understand. I went ahead and put that in the brackets, trying to make it as easy as possible. And so. I'm just going to run through it, and uh, hopefully this will be helpful. So it starts off, it's Malachi speaking. Malachi, uh, he's a prophet. He's speaking to the nation of Israel, and he starts off with, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. And then he speaks on behalf of the Lord, um, and that Lord is L-O-R-D, all caps, so that's Jehovah, the eternal God. It says, I have loved you. And Israel responds, Wherein hast thou loved us? And the Lord Lord answers, was not Esau Jacob's brother? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountain and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. And then Edom pops up from off stage, says, We are impoverished, impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. The Lord rebuts that they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And your eyes, again speaking to Israel, shall see, and ye shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. So this quick little back and forth between the Lord and Israel is he's saying that there's a difference between how he has loved and cared for Israel than everyone else. Even Jacob's brother uh, Esau um, and Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and from him descended the nation of Israel. From Esau descended the nation of Edom. Um, he said that you know, this is after the captivity. Um, the Jews have come out. They've rebuilt their wall. They're rebuilding their um, temple. The sacrifices have been restarted after the captivity. And so this is the, this is the last book that we know of that was uh, you know, written um, before we go into this period of about 400 years before there's going to be silence, really. There's not going to be any public prophet speaking until... Uh, John the Baptist comes on the, the scene, or the angels come to John the Baptist's parents, really. Um, and so the difference here between Israel and Edom is that the Lord is continuing to bless Israel to exist, um, whereas he said e Edom's going to be cut off. They think they're going to be able to come back from uh, whatever has brought them low. You know, remember when uh, Israel went into captivity, Edom was still fine. They're actually mocking and laughing and turning in the folks who were escaping. Um, and there was a condemnation um, published against them that they are going to be cut off um, for how they responded to Israel going into captivity. And so this is, you know, they've been humbled and that, you know, they think they're going to make a comeback and they'll say, nope, they'll build, I'll throw down. And you should call them the border of wickedness. And so the difference, Jacob was loved, Esau was hated. And that's later going to be quoted in uh, Romans. Um, so. Now the Lord's going to turn his attention, instead of speaking to the whole nation of Israel, he's going to focus on the priests. It's called, and here the text describes, it goes from Lord Jehovah, and now it describes it the Lord of hosts. And host is the armies. And this is the eternal God of all armies, hosts, um, all the forces. Imagine that. All right, so great power. Lord of hosts, and speaking to the priests, it says, A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If I then be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? O priests that despise my name. The priests respond, 
wherein have we despised thy name? And the Lord of hosts, ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar. And the priest defensively, wherein have we polluted thee? And the Lord of hosts says, in that ye say, quoting the priest, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if ye offer blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? Evil. And if ye offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person? So he's calling out the priests for not honoring the Lord, for not fearing them, and telling them that they really despise his names. Now, they, they don't recognize that at first. Um, and he's telling us because that you are treating um, sacrifices that are given to the Lord as being something of low esteem. They're, they're not a big deal. Um, part of the law was that if you were going to offer a sacrifice, it had to be perfect. It couldn't be, you know, your ugly three-legged blind lamb that's got scurvy that you didn't really want in your flock anyway. Um, let's go ahead and cull that one and we'll go give him to the Lord. We'll kill two birds with one stone, get the weakling out, and we'll, you know, honor the Lord. He says, well, if you take that sorry uh, animal and you give it to your political leader, the governor who's over Israel this time, which is not a king at this point, is he going to be pleased with your sorry sacrifice? The answer is no. So why are you giving it to the Lord? And by doing so, you're saying that the table of the Lord is contemptible or to be held in low esteem. Then Malachi, and I think this is Malachi speaking. You can read and determine for yourself, but it shifts um, into language that sounds like somebody other than the Lord speaking. It says, and now I pray you, beseech God that he will be gracious unto us, that this hath been by your means, will he regard your persons? I think this is an interjection of the prophet saying, okay, this is what's going on. This is the Lord speaking. He's calling you out. You need to beg him that he'll be gracious. You know, this has been within your means. These are things that you've done. Is he going to regard your person? Um, is he going to have respect unto you while you're defiling his altars by offering these sorry sacrifices? And then it shifts back to the Lord says, Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught, for nothing? Neither do you kindle fire on my altar for nothing, for naught. I have no pleasure in you. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. For from the rising of the sun, even to the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name. And a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the heathen. Among the heathen. But ye have profaned it. And that ye say, the table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. Ye also say, behold, what weariness it is, and ye have snuffed at it to like blow or and ye brought that which is torn and the lame and the sick thus have you brought an offering should i accept this of your hand but cursed be the deceiver which hath in his flock a male and voweth and sacrificeth unto the lord a corrupt thing for i am a great king and my name is dreadful among the heathen so in one of these first two sentences the lord saying who is there even among you that would shut the doors for nothing Neither do you kindle fire on my altar for nothing. Um, two different ways to read this. I'm not fully settled in my mind. Um, one could be you're performing this service for the Lord of keeping the doors, um, as the porters were, and you're kindling fires for the sacrifices. You're not doing it for nothing. You're being paid by the Lord, and that the Levites and the priests were all, um, you know, they were fed from the tithes and um, contributions that all the other tribes had to give. And so the Lord is making their provision for their daily bread through that service. So you're not doing it for nothing. The other way to read it is that as condemning them of you don't shut the doors and you don't condemn, condemn, uh, kindle the fire unless you've gotten something in addition to that. Um, and you could read that like it, they're getting bribes um, here don't shut the door on me um, because this is an unworthy sacrifice. Go ahead and take it. Here's a little something on the side. Um, and and, I, and again, I'm not really sure. I've read commentaries both ways about people, what they think that means. But there's there's something about the Lord not being pleased with their service. Um, um, and, and he doesn't want to accept the, the offerings that they're given. Just, but there's something different coming. 
Um, this is foreshadowing the change in uh, worship service instead of being the you know, Old Testament Levitical law. Only the priests could offer sacrifices. Only the priests could burn incense to the Lord. Some other folks tried and had this whole debacle with Korin and Korah and uh, Dathan and Abiram uh, who tried to take that upon themselves and the Lord killed them. I mean, 250 guys with censers tried to offer sin sense. The Lord sent fire out, killed them. The ringleaders were opened up into a pit in the earth, and the earth closed about flat. And then there was a plague to top it all off for another 14,000 folks because people got um, huffy with Moses because the Lord punished these folks who were trying to take on this role of being a priest. And so under that structure, only they could do it. That was how the Lord set it out. But then under the New Testament structure, where you've got beyond just the, the Jews and includes the, the Gentiles. It says, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, and in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering for my name shall be great among the heathen. We won't go to it for the sake of time today, but you can see uh, in Revelation where the prayers of saints are like incense. And so maybe we're not literally burning incense to the Lord, but every time you pray that there is a sweet odor going up before the Lord, being offered and glorifying his name and that pure offering that's christ himself you know the only pure offering he was the the perfect lamb of god for my name shall be great among the heathen so even though the jews hold, have, are holding him in low regard by how they're serving him um he will have his name great among the heathen the broader world but ye have profaned it and that ye say the table of the lord is polluted and the fruit thereof even his meat is contemptible you also say, but hold, what a weariness it is. Now, this was particularly convicting to me as I'm trying to uh, labor as a pastor. Behold, what a weariness it is to serve the Lord. When we get into an attitude of that, we're really in trouble. Um, we're way off base. Um, where we're Whatever we're seeking satisfaction or validation in is not in God himself. We have you know, been reduced down to just thinking it's drudgery. Um, it doesn't mean it won't be hard. It doesn't mean it won't be challenges. But these guys are, are off base where the table of the Lord. Now, the priest of the sacrifices, many portions of what was sacrificed were reserved for the priests for their, their daily meat. And so here, you know, they may be dealing with the benefits of their own laziness. That if you're allowing people to bring in these inferior sacrifices then that means you're getting inferior food yourself and and you're holding it there contemptible they don't care they don't like it anymore and again that might lead into being willing to take bribes so you can get your own provision um it's not explicitly mentioned in this book i was looking up some other cross references where um other prophets are condemning judges for taking bribes for priest hiring themselves out instead of teaching knowledge, but they're requiring sums um, to, to share information. So I mean, that, kind of, that kind of thread goes through there. So to take that interpretation with, with a grain of salt. But, but either way, the Lord is upset. Um, they polluted the table. That's what they're saying. Uh, they say the table is polluted. Some meat is contemptible or held in scorn. They also say, well, behold, what a weariness it is. I mean, these are the priests talking, and the Lord's quoting them. You've snuffed at it. You brought in that which torn and lame and sick. You brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand? And it says, but curse be the deceiver. This is the guy who's bringing in that lame, sick, torn thing, saying, eh, it's the best I got. He says, you're a deceiver. If you've got in your flock a male, which you're supposed to bring, and you've made a vow saying, you know, here I'm doing something. Here's the sacrifice that goes with that. And then you sacrifice the Lord a curse thing. He says, curse be that deceiver. For I am a great king. And that's that's you know, not an understatement. It's the Lord speaking. I am a great king, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. He continues. The Lord of hosts says, And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, and if you will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, I will even send a curse among you. I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because ye do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed, and this refers to your posterity, and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feasts, and one shall take you away with it. All right, so remember the solemn feast when you had everybody come together to Jerusalem, which happened three times a year. Got a lot of animals coming. There's going to be a lot of uh, excrement 
produced by all the animals that are there in town. And then at the specific moment when you're sacrificing, there is a cleansing and washing process that you had to do. And the parts that were not fit to be burned, um, including the dung, were to be carried off. And he's saying that I'm going to take that unfit portion. Yeah, you've got sacrifice, but I'm going to take that unfit portion, as, as it were, smeared upon your face. And when it's carried away, you'll be carried away too. That's that's some pretty scary uh, language for the Lord of the universe to be describing a you. And and part of this is pointing to the fact that this priesthood is, is going to change. It's going to go away. And you shall know that I've sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi. All the priests are sons of Levi and the uh, descendants of Aaron, Moses' brother. And then the Levites um, beyond that family um, were the ones who helped serve the temple and tabernacle. My covenant with him was of life and peace. And I gave them to him life and peace. For fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth. So this is the description of the priest doing right. The law of truth was in his mouth. Iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, did turn many away from iniquity. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should keep the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. They got like six different things describing the faithful priest and how he's walking with the Lord and how he is you know, encouraging other people to do right and to avoid evil. But then he gets to these priests. But ye are departed out of the way, not following the Lord's path. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi. So not only are you giving people bad advice, you're you know, actively leading folks astray. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. And then interjects, I believe, Malachi with the expression, Have we not all one father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother? By profaning the covenant of our fathers. Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he hath loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. All right. So we got two different things about dealing treacherously with your brother. You've got the priest showing partiality. They're not. Uh, often priests were used to resolve conflicts, um, just like the judges were. And so here, if you're showing partiality, you're preferring one over another from their pedigree or from their uh, you know, riches versus not. Um, they're being unjust. And it says, have we not all one father? We're all of the same tribe. If not God created us. But why are we treating each other badly and profaning the covenant of you know, our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And then it gives a different um, example of how they've dealt treacherously, or another example, and that is when the priests and, and many folks within Israel are going beyond what they were allowed to do and that they were only supposed to marry within the nation of Israel. And here it says they're marrying the daughter of a strange god. So these are Gentiles. These are um, daughters of, of idol worshipers. It says the Lord will cut off the man that doeth this. The master and the scholar out of the tabernacles of Jacob and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And ye have done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears and weeping and crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Go read uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, the two books that describe what happened after the captivity and the rebuilding. That was a problem they had among the people, is that this small group was sent back to Jerusalem to start. You know, the nation over again and rebuilding, and they started marrying uh, outside the nation. And so one of them, I think it was Ezra, required them to go through and have divorces for all these people and put them away. Um, and so that was an issue even among the priests. Um, so the leaders were supposed to know better. And here it says the Lord's going to cut them off, whether he's a master or a scholar. Um, you know, the, the top ones within the tabernacle, he's going to cut them off um, from being able to offer to the offerings to the Lord. And he says, he regards, not, he regards not your offering anymore. You know, there's been tears and weeping and crying out, covering the altar. Who those tears and weeping are? It sounds like it's these men's first wives. It sounds like they put away their Jewish wives, the wives of their youth, and then took upon these other um, Gentile women um, as second or multiple wives, 
So Israel asked, why? Why has he cut us off? Um, and Malachi answers, because the Lord hath been a witness against thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one? That's God in the beginning made male and female and you know, gave them, you know, gave the female to the male. And, and that was when marriage was instituted. God brought Adam, uh, Eve to Adam and therefore you know, he shall leave father and mother and they shall cleave together and they shall be one. Did he not make them one? You know, God's the active party in creating the marriage. Yet he had the residue of the spirit. And wherefore one? Why did he create one? That he might seek a godly seed. Right? Again, this was within the nation of Israel to stay within the creating the offspring within the Israelites. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith, He hateth putting away, for one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. This is interesting imagery of he hates putting away, the putting away of the wife, um, and then describes it as one covering violence with his garment. There is violence done to you know the the spouse when they're wrongfully put away, and it's like it's it's like it's papering over it, hiding it with a garment so you can't see it, um, but it's still there. Um, Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you deal not treacherously. And then Malachi comes, finishes up. You have wearied the Lord with your words. Israel pops up. Wherein have we wearied him? Malachi, when ye say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, he delighteth in them. Or, where is the God of judgment? So he says, you've wearied him in two different ways. And these are two ditches. And you see these prominent today. One or someone says, yeah, he's doing wrong, but he's got a good heart, and he's good, and the Lord loves him, and uh, the Lord has delight in him. You don't see any evidence of that in his life, but we're going to say that. So everyone, regardless of how wickedly they're living, the Lord just loves him. He's doing good. That's one ditch. That's not having discernment as to you know, actually observing the fruits of someone's life to see if they're serving the Lord or they're not. The other is sitting with your hands on your hips, looking down on somebody with no saying, well, why is not the Lord just strike him down dead? Where's the God of judgment? You know, they're messing up. Lord needs to just kill them. <laughs> right? So you got no one's doing wrong. Where is just the instant wrath? Where's the God of judgment? Both are ditches. Right? You need to have reason and discernment. So it says those kinds of words have wearied the Lord. And the Lord of hosts says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. This is John the Baptist. And the Lord, whom ye seek, shall, shall, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. That Lord whom ye seek, the Messiah who you're waiting for, Jesus the Christ, shall come into his temple. And he does. The Lord goes into the temple in Jerusalem um, on multiple occasions. And it's not pleasant for those who are there working, you know, selling their goods. He flips over their tables and drives them off with a scourge um, in his righteous anger for them defiling his father's house. He shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, it's going to be the new covenant, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come. And then I think this is Malachi talk, talking here. It may still be the Lord, but we'll read through. It says, who may abide the day of his coming, referring to that messenger, and who shall stand when he appeareth? You know, who's going to be able to remain? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. Now, I don't make silver and I don't wash wool, but the purpose of both of these jobs is to take something that is impure and to make it pure. So um, gray wool ain't very popular. And so a fuller will take soap and it will um, wash and basically bleach it, a um, real harsh process um, to make it white. Um, you know, describing elsewhere in the Bible, it describes as being white and whiter than any fuller soap could make it, right? And the refiner's fire is you're taking really this impure elements of metal and you're heating it up and you're able to separate the impurities from the, the pureness. So he's saying this is referring to the messenger, Jesus. He, when he comes in the day of his coming, he's going to be a refiner. He's going to be a fuller. He's going to be a purifier. He shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as silver and gold. 
that they may offer unto the Lord an offering of righteousness. What I think this is literally referring to is his washing and cleansing and purifying of us of all of our sins. That's the only way we can offer an offer of righteousness is by the righteousness that he puts upon us after he's removed our sins. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Um, elsewhere, there's a description about God's children in the New Testament being described as kings and priests. And so when you see this language about um, priests giving offerings, and so that's one of the way that we are priests and we give sacrifices of prayer, we give sacrifices of our uh, our body as a temple um, and in praise, glorifying God. Um, all right. Offering of Judah and Jerusalem be present of the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. The Lord of hosts continues, I will come near to you to judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers, and against the false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling and his wages, and against those that oppress the widow, and against those that oppress the fatherless, adding that language just for clarity there, and turn aside the stranger from his right. Um, under the law, the strangers were allowed to have certain um, food from the field, the corners of the widows. Um, and fear not me. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. All right? So I'll send my messenger, then the Lord will come, and then I will come. So you've got John the Baptist, you've got Jesus um, coming into the world, purifying uh, all of his people, and then you've got this reference to the final coming when he comes in judgment. And the Lord returns as a swift witness against, and you've got this list of those who are not serving him, sorcerers, adulterers, false swearers, those that are oppressing the poor, hireling, the widows, the fatherless or orphans, and those that are turning away strangers, and that don't fear him. He says, I'm the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. What does that mean? Well, one, it means he's the Lord and doesn't change. The other is, therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. That goes all the way back to the very beginning of Jacob have I loved. That's why they haven't been consumed, because they've been disobeying him <laughs> from the beginning, really. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you. So you got, here's the reason you haven't been wiped out despite your disobedience, because of my love for you. Return unto me, given an opportunity for repentance, and I'll return unto you. Israel asked, wherein shall we return? How are you going to return? What do you mean? Still, you know, ignorant of, of what they think they've done. Lord of Host asks a question: Will a man rob God? So, well, that's a crazy thing to do. He says, "Yet ye have robbed me, Israel. Where have we robbed thee, Lord of Hosts? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation." Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that was the tenth of their increase, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land. And so, in Israel, there was promises for obedience that there would be you know, actual blessings in their in their nation and their returns. And here, as at other times in their history, they had gotten um, stingy with not following through on what he had told them to bring. And this, all these ties, that was what supported the priests and what supported the Levites and what fed them throughout the years, since they didn't have their own inheritance. The ties were theirs. Um, and so if those are not being brought in, at one point, again, it's either in Ezra and Nehemiah, um, when he came back from a journey, he had to go find all the Levites because they had left to go work their fields because no one was bringing in the tithes and they were hungry. Um, so you can see why they may think the, the sacrifices and everything is contemptible. If the people don't care and they bring the sorry stuff, why should I care either? Um, and it makes it more tempting to take bribes from people to 
to help supplement your income, if that makes sense. And it says, bring it in. Don't rob me anymore, the whole nation. Do as you're told. It's all Lord's anyway. This is the portion he's told you to bring to the temple. And he says, I'll open and prove me. Prove me now. And he's testing me. And see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. That there shall not be room enough to receive it. And then he goes in to say that your words have been stout against me. And Israel pops up. What have we spoken so much against thee? And the Lord of hosts says, ye have said it's vain to serve God. And what profit is it if we kept his ordinances and we walk mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, that tempt God are even delivered. And so you've got this completely worldly uh, mindset within the priests there saying there's, there's no profit to serve the Lord. You know, we're doing his stuff. And it's just, it's a drudgery. We're mournfully going for the motions. Um, and we see those who are lifted up with pride. They look happy to us. And, and those who are working wickedness, they seem to be improving. And those that are tempting God, they're all having a really good time. But us are trying to serve the Lord. It's just, it's just crappy. And, and he says those words are very stout against the Lord. That's um, them some bold words. Right? Uh, and then it seems like Malachi pops in. Then they that feared the Lord. So this is very different than those who are speaking that way. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. So those that fear the Lord are communing together, speaking to each other. And the Lord hearkened. I mean, he heard. He listened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. So there's a, a marked difference between those who are going through the motion saying it's just vain to serve the Lord versus those that fear the Lord and are thinking upon his name. He says, the Lord is listening to your conversations among your fellow believers. And it says a book of remembrance is written before him. He's taken note of it. Um, and here's what it says. The Lord of hosts and they shall be mine in the day that I make up my jewels referring to those that fear the Lord. In the day that he gathers his people and make up my jewels, I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Indeed, he's made us his adopted sons and children. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. All right. So if you want a good definition between what's the difference between righteous and wicked, here it is. The righteous serves God. The wicked does it. He that serveth him not. It says, you'll return and discern. You know, there's language that describes the saints being judges. And on that final judgment, notable day, I think they'll be able to sit and recognize who are the Lords and who are not. It says, for behold, the day cometh there sh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. This will be the final cutting off. There won't be any continuance. There won't be additional posterity. This is the second judgment, I believe, where it's the end. Um, but unto you that fear my name shall the Son, and that's S-U-N, like the brilliance of light, the Son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Calves of the stall are the well-fatted ones. They're the ones who got roofs over their head. They get daily provision. They're the ones that are cared for. He says, that's how you're going to be treated versus those who don't. Those who are going to be burned up as an, burned up as an oven. And the proud and wicked shall be the stubble cast into it. So you've got the son of righteousness arising with healing his wings. Interesting imagery there. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I do this. So it's not even going to be like breaking a strong stick. Just you know, imagine stepping into a pile of ashes. It's just complete crumbling. Remember ye, again, this is the Lord speaking, remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb, the mountain, for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, look at here, let me tell you something. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. 
This prophet Elijah is again referring to John the Baptist. This language right here is quoted by the angel that appears to John the Baptist's father, uh, Zechariah, saying that he's going to come in the spirit and power of Elijah, and he's going to turn the heart of the fathers to the children. Um, and the way all this reads, and if you're you know, an Old Testament priest, you may think that uh, John the Baptist is going to come, and then you've immediately got this judgment, because they seem to be so closely uh, linked. But, um, as is revealed in the New Testament, there's a gap between Lord Jesus coming and coming as a sacrificial lamb, and when he returns as the victorious um, king of all kings. So, the book of Malachi.